Good morning, it's, uh, Bible for Truth. Um, so I'm gonna do this video. I hope I did one earlier, you know, it's kind of long and I noticed there's some static, so I'm redoing it. And also I thought it might be beneficial to have it so that you can see two newspapers um, set side by side. Now, what I wanna point out is the, the newspaper here, this one here, this one's uh, by Vox, right here, Vox, okay? This one here, this newspaper is, is called Haaretz, right? You see this little thing here? This is Haaretz, or however you pronounce it. This is uh, Haaretz, right? Haaretz talks to his author, A. Scott Berg, okay? And it's basically both newspapers are talking about a president, President Woodrow Wilson. I just want to start out by showing you how they talk about Woodrow Wilson in the Haaretz paper, right? And then I want to show you about how they, the reality of Woodrow Wilson that's documented by Vox, okay? Now, also I want to establish something else. I did a video that was eight minutes and 11 seconds, very concise. And in that video that was very concise, somebody didn't like it, even though I don't even talk in the video, because what I did was I pieced together some things about Woodrow Wilson and talking about the agenda that's very obvious if you just study history. And so what people don't want you to do is they don't want you to see any tie to imperialist, colonialist agendas that are based on race. And so I'm telling you that race is something that's a social construct that is made by men and it was made for a specific purpose. And if you look in history, you can see very clearly the belief that certain people had with regards to race and manifest destiny, where would they use religion as a pretext to justify them stealing, killing, and robbing people of their lands and resources and just saying, well, we can do this to you because according to the Bible, you're not really human. You know, you're less than, you're other, you're not one of us, okay? So I'm gonna let it go at that. That's two minutes in. Let's start with Harris first. Who is the most pro-Jewish US president? Woodrow Wilson, obviously. A new biography of the 28th American president depicts him as an idealist Democrat whose moral and political influences still reverberates today. Harris talked to his author, A. Scott Byrd, okay? This was uh, published 2013, okay? Not too long ago, this is, I mean, 2013 is too long ago. Woodrow Wilson's been gone for a while, guys, so it's not hard to dig up the truth on Woodrow Wilson, right? Okay. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is, I want you to notice, like, just it just so happens that this picture of uh, Trump and uh, Yahoo is here. So if you notice the complexion between these two men, even though this is, you know, muted, what's the difference? If you notice the complexion of these two men, the shade, at least, of these two men, and Woodrow Wilson, what's the difference? It's not that, from a dis discernible eye, it's not that different. So are you going to say that this guy, quote unquote, Netanyahu is some uh, Semitic minority and this guy is not? You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> that's just something from a visual optic standpoint you can see, but people seem to be blind to. OK, so when you say race, which is an invention, you say, OK, well, you say people are black, you say people are brown, you say people are red, yellow, and then you say they're white. Right. You say black, brown, red, yellow, white. Those are the five colors that you assign to people. What color is so-called Jew? What color is Jew? Because according to the thing that happened with Nick Cannon, basically they're talking about, look, we have to establish better relations between the black race and the so-called Jewish race. And that's trying to basically exclude the idea of there being black Jews. But all that is, again, predicated on the idea of race, which is in of itself a fallacy. It's an invention. It's a concoction. So let's talk about this. Reading this, getting into this article, after addressing some of the problems plaguing our modern world, including war, chemical weapons, terrorism, global economic crisis, 
U.S. President Barack Obama concludes in his speech to the United Nations General Assembly on Tuesday by saying, I know that the side of history I want the United States to be on. We're ready to meet tomorrow's challenges with you firmly in the belief that all men and women are in fact created equal, equally. That's why we look to the future not with fear, but with hope. And that's why we remain convinced that this community of nations can deliver a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world to the next generation. Okay? And of course, who could foresee the, the, the plagues, right? So it goes some other couple of things. And it says, Obama's address includes more than faint echoes of another principled democratic intent of transforming America's society and the world beyond it. Think about it. This is the goal. Transforming America's society and the world beyond it. Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president of the United States and the man who led his country into the First World War. Now, 100 years after his inauguration, Wilson is subject of a new biography that portrays him as one of the most influential figures of the 20th century, an idealist who uttered such gems as, tell me what is right and I will fight for it. Wilson has been described as a hopeless romantic, a stubborn fool who was outmaneuvered by France and Great Britain at the negotiating table following World War I. However, in A. Scott Berg's biography, Wilson, by Putman Press, the book's namesake emerges as a formidable statesman, one who was influenced, who has influenced the decision making of every American president since his tenure. What he, what Scott Berg is saying here in his biography is like he was not out so called maneuvered. He knew what he was doing. Okay, that's what he's saying. Berg, the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Charles. Lindbergh and Hollywood producer Samuel Goldwyn sat down with Harris to discuss Wilson's legacy and its effect on modern politics and the Obama administration's policies, and why Wilson is what he calls the most pro-Jewish president in American history. So these guys are saying that Jew is a race, so he's the most pro-Jewish race president in American history. Why is the Wilson presidency so relevant to the Obama presidency? Wilson is the father of America's modern foreign policy. For 125 years, the U.S. was an introvert nation, meaning they mind their own business, supposedly, that clung on to its isolationism. Wilson posed the question, what is America's role in the world? Think about that. And the answer he gave in his speech in Congress on April 2nd, 1917, asking the legislature to declare war on Germany was that it is America's duty to ensure the world must be what? Safe for democracy. Okay? This credo has been espoused for good and bad by every president since Wilson, most recently Barack Obama. Okay? Wilson was the most, right? Wilson was the most idealistic of America's presidents. He spoke often and eloquently about America's moral obligation. He weighed idealism with interventionism, right? Forget being isolationist and minding your own business. We're going to go and intervene. He urged his countrymen to fight, listen, preemptively for principles. That means you go start wars. You know how we have a Department of Defense? Well, there's no Department of Offense. So we we never attack people unprovoked, so it's... It's preemptive because we knew that they were going to do something ahead of time. Hence, we went to attack them before they can attack us. We, we, we take the battle to them, fight them over there so that they don't bring the battle over here. That's what they say. And there's no such thing as a false flag, right? We understand that. And even though there was the um, revelation that the um, Obama's chemical weapons of mass destruction were a lie, then that is just a moot point. I guess that's something not to be taken into account. All right. So he urges countrymen to fight preemptively for principles. Instead of retaliating for attacks against them, he obliged at the U.S. to assist all, listen, all peoples in pursuit of freedom and self-determination. All peoples in the, in the pursuit of freedom and self-determination. Obama has fully embraced this moralism most recently when he saw congressional, congressional approval to punish Syria for its deadly use of chemical weapons. Again, 
Same thing Bush said. In fact, listening to his speech on Syria, I thought Obama's ideas and phraseology were ripped right out of Wilson's playbook. Interventionism preemptively. Yet, listen, he's saying, look, why are people criticizing Obama? He's doing a great thing. He's, he's following after Wilson. Yet Obama has been criticized for his lack of leadership. Obama was described as too slow to act on Syria, but I see his deliberation as strength, not weakness, and I see a parallel to Wilson. Wilson believed in patient consideration in creating space for solutions to appear. There was nothing hot-headed about him. In fact, much like Obama today, Wilson was considered an aloof intellectual. Right? Aloof intellectual. But to my mind, Obama took a very reasoned approach towards Syria. He had lurched into attack the Russian proposal for international monitors to take over and destroy Syria's arsenal of chemical weapons could not have emerged. Okay? You write that Wilson was a highly effective president, ruling mostly with his rhetoric. Couldn't the same be said for Obama? Well, Obama is a great orator, but he is less successful than Wilson. Wilson did not only rely on speechwriters and posters, he wrote all of his own speeches, and everything he uttered came from the heart and mind. I believe that. It came from the heart. I believe it. it did come from the heart and mind. He spoke directly to the people. Wilson was the first president to deliver an address by radio and also the first to hold formal press conferences. And he spoke to the people through reporters. Most importantly, that means he, he spoke to the people through reporters. The news, right? That means the news was a, a, a piece, a mouthpiece. More importantly, he engaged lawmakers in person, right? He was the first president since John Adams to deliver his message on the floor of the Congress, and he had a sustained dialogue with Congress. He called 25 joint sessions in order to advance an ambition, ambitious progressive agenda, and he spent a lot of time at the Capitol. So he's saying, like, he, this guy was busy. He's, he called 25 joint sessions in order to advance an, an um, ambitious progressive agenda, he, meaning he was progressing towards a goal, right? He spent a lot of time doing that. Congress sometimes gave Wilson a hard time. He failed to convince Republican senators to accept his cherished vision for a what? League of Nations, right? Forget that being isolationist, individual countries. We need you guys to be yoked together for a common cause. But for most of his presidency, lawmakers listened to him. Because if it appears regularly before, because if you appear regularly before your potential enemies, they respect you. Wilson thought that the executive and legislative branch should be, should cooperate, right? So he's basically pitting, saying lawmakers were basically his, his enemy. And he says, you know, you appear before them enough, they respect you. But Wilson thought that executive and legislative branch would still cooperate. Obama lurches from crisis to crisis. A continuity of dialogue is lacking. So he's kind of critiquing Obama here. Was Wilson naive and innocent abroad? Is Obama? Wilson was unabashedly hopeful. He believed in humankind. Okay? Entering the First World War, he called on Americans to fight for a peace without victory. Not for empire. Not for riches. Why are we doing this battle? It's, it's not for empire. It's not for riches. Now, you guys believe that? Speaking about America's role abroad, Obama echoes this sentiment. Is that naive? Perhaps, but it's inspiring. Basically, he's saying these people, these men are warring. This you'd have to think that the Bible right here is where you call. You just got to call God just a liar. Like men don't war for money, for riches, for gain, right? That's not what why men war. No, it's you know he fought this. He's euphem, euphemistically, no, I mean, altruistic motives here. Selfless. Okay. In late 1917, listen. The British government asked President Wilson to support a declaration of sympathy with the Zionist movement. Okay? So YouTube doesn't have to remove my, my videos anymore because all I'm doing is reading what Haaretz. Now, if you want to remove something and censor somebody, then censor Haaretz for writing this. In 1917, the British government, which is a race, this is 1917. The British government, what was going on in America in 1917? Tolerance? No. The British government asked President Wilson to support a declaration of sympathy with the Zionist movement. And he did. He did. Wilson supported the Balfour Declaration, 
the establishment of Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, which they're calling a race. Okay? He did so despite the advice of his trusted confidant, Colonel Edward House, who acted as the America's first national security advisor. So he had a national security advisor who advised him against it. Woodrow Wilson, who's supposed to be in the interest of America, decided that, no, we're not going to be, quote, unquote, isolationists. We're going to start fighting preemptive wars. And then I'm going to go ignore my national security advisor. But I'm going to listen to the British who want me to have sympathy with the Zionist movement for the national home of the so-called Jewish race. You must remember that at the time, the U.S. was extremely anti-Semitic. OK, so you see a theme. So expressing support for the Balfour Declaration was very was a very courageous act. Now he's tying in. Right. If you're against Zionism, you're against the Jewish people. And when you support Zionism, you're supporting the Jewish people who are a race. And thus, you're not being racist because to go against Zionism is to be a racist, right? So he supported the Balfour Declaration, and that's very courageous to not be a racist against God's, quote unquote, God's holy land, who are associated with a holy people, which are a race, according to these guys. Wilson was the most Christian president the U.S. had ever had. He was the son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers who prayed on his knees twice a day and read the Bible every night. He was also the most pro-Jewish president the U.S. had ever had. He appointed the first Jew to the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, a fervent Zionist. He counseled Wilson about the Balfour Declaration. Okay, so he was counseled about the Balfour Declaration. And who else was into this thing? The British government, okay? He did, he supported the Balfour Declaration. Right. He had appointed who somehow he had appointed this guy, Louis Brandeis, who was a fervent Zionist. And this guy counseled him about the Balfour Direct Declaration and who would go on to champion an individual's right to privacy and free speech. Right. So Louis Brandeis supposedly went on to champion individual rights to privacy and free speech. Now, mind you, this is important because we're going to talk about his guy was the first Jew in the Supreme Court, right? Supreme Court. He is influential to Woodrow Wilson, who ignored his own national security advisor, right? He ignored his own national security advisor, sided with the British, supported this guy who claims to be a Jew, and is a fervent Zionist. And Woodrow Wilson listened to his counsel. He took his counsel, but ignored the counsel of the National Security Advisor. Okay? So he's saying this guy, Louis Brandeis, right? First Jew, supposed Jew, fervent Zionist, counsel him about the Balfour Declaration to help establish and support Zionism. And he said this guy, Louis Brandeis, was all a champion of individual rights to privacy and free speech. He brought the financier, Bernard Burrock, into government, and he appointed Henry Morgenthau as the ambassador of the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. People are in place, right? Earlier, as president of Princeton University, Wilson appointed the first Jew, right? Which is not, guys, this is, this is instrumental if you know the truth, because you know it's not a race, right? But he appointed the first, the first so-called Jew to the faculty. And as governor of New Jersey, prior to becoming president, he appointed the first Jew to the Supreme, to the state's Supreme Court. Now, that's prior to becoming president. He had already done this thing. Right. Right. Before he was president, he got people in positions in, in Princeton and he got people in positions in the Supreme Court. State Supreme Court, in New Jersey. And he appointed what Louis Brandeis. Right. 
to the Supreme Court. Okay? That's it. Okay? All right. So we're 19 minutes in. Okay? I want to concentrate on a couple of things. I want to concentrate on a couple of things. Okay. We're going to go to this one. We're here now. Woodrow Wilson was extremely racist even by the standards of his time. <clears throat> this Wednesday, a group of Princeton students formed the offices of President, stormed the offices of President uh, Christopher Look, Ice Grubber, to demand that Woodrow Wilson name be removed from all programs and buildings at the university. That's a big ask. Princeton has an entire school, the Woodrow Wilson School of Pol Public and uh, International Affairs, named after Wilson, who served as university president for 19, from 1902 to 1910. So eight years before his time in the what? White House, right? So he made some key, he made some key, um, he made some key appointments, right? It talks about earlier as president of Princeton, Wilson appointed the first so-called Jew to the faculty as governor and as a governor of New Jersey prior to becoming president. He appointed the first Jew to the state Supreme Court. Okay. So it is it also has Wilson's College, a residential college for undergrads. So far, the university is standing firm, insisting that in the Associated Press words, it is important to weigh Wilson's racism and how bad it is with the contributions he made to the nation. What nation? What nation did he make a contrib contribution to? Because he did not listen to his um, national security advisor. He listened to the British and the counselor, uh, the person whom he himself appointed. So he appointed a guy himself and said, oh, I'm taking counsel from the guy that I appointed. Right? And outside of Princeton, the incident is being seized upon as yet another example of campus PC run amok. Here's what they're writing, look. Joe Scarborough, right, NBC. Insanity breaks out at Princeton. Now Woodrow Wilson is a racist pig. Enough, enough, stand firm, President Eisgruber, right? So this Joe Scarborough is highly in support, right? And, and notice this. This is, I think this is Alabama. Right, this is supposed to be Alabama school, right? Some significance there with the history of Alabama and that school. Leaving aside the broader question of whether Wilson's name should be removed, let's be clear on one thing. Woodrow Wilson was, in fact, a racist pig. He was a racist, they're calling him a racist pig. That's like calling him an animal. That's wrong. Somebody should take that down. He was a racist, he was racist by current standards, and he was a racist by the standards of 1910. You know, there's, there's people try to, oh, well, for the time. No, for the time, nothing. A period widely acknowledged by historians as the nadir of post-civil race relations in the United States. Woodrow Wilson resegregated the federal government. Okay? I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, what I want you to see is I want you to see something. I want you to see something between the narrative that we're being sold here and the narrative that's being sold in the quote-unquote Harris, this paper that's uh, in Israel. Because they're talking about how Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson stood for all these great um, aspirations with regards to human rights. And they said Wilson was the most idealistic of America's presidents. He spoke often and eloquently about America's moral obligation he wed idealism with interventionism. He urged countrymen to fight preemptively instead of retaliating. Start the fight, right? Bring the fight to them. And he obliged the U.S. to assist all peoples in the pursuit of freedom and self-determination. Right? Freedom and self-determination. All people. Emphasis. Okay? Let's, keep, let's go to the back over here. Easily the worst part of Wood Woodrow Wilson's record as president was his overseeing of the resegregation of multiple agencies of the federal government, which had been surprisingly integrated as a result of Reconstruction decades earlier. Decades early, it had been integrated. At an April 11, 1913 cabinet meeting, Postmaster General Albert 
Burleson argued for segregating the railway mail office. He took exception to the fact that workers shared glasses, towels, and washrooms. Wilson offered no objection to Burleson's plan for segregation, saying that he wished the matter adjusted in a way to make the least friction. He doesn't want friction. He says do it, but do it in a way that doesn't cause a public outcry. You know what I mean? Stealthily. This is the man whom Haretz is saying was the most pro-Jewish president, very instrumental in Zionism, led America into the First World War, went against his security advisor, appointed so-called Jews to high-level positions, including in, Prin in Princeton, a state senator in New Jersey, Supreme Court in New Jersey, I'm sorry, and then the National Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis who was his advisor that was instrumental in the Balfour Declaration thing. Well, instrumental in, uh, and uh, yeah, instrumental in, in, in his support for Zionism, right? Now, this guy is his advisor, and he's in high position. So let's see how he advised Woodrow Wilson when it came to this these things, okay? Because he's instrumental, and he's Wilson, who didn't listen to his national security advisor, did listen to this man who claims to be a Jew. So let's see how this guy's name comes up as fighting for against Wilson and trying to support, you know, civil rights as they claim he did, right? All right. So it says, um, do it with the least, the William Secretary do, took Wilson's comment as authorization to segregate. The Department of Treasury and Post Office Department both introduced screen off workplaces, separate lunchrooms, and separate bathrooms. And in 1913 open letter to Wilson, W.E.B. Du Bois, who has supported Wilson in the 1912 election before being disenchanted by a desegregation policy, wrote of, wrote of one colored clerk who could not actually be segregated in, in a, on an account of the nature of his work and who consequently had a cage built around him to separate him from his companions of many years. I want to know where was Louis Brandeis? this great advocate for human rights, given that the whole point was he was looking to the pursuit of freedom and self-determination, right? Because this is the whole thing, right? Where was Louis Brandeis? Where were all these great people that he appointed and all these great positions throughout, high positions throughout the, 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 the his, wherever he went. He went to Princeton, he got to the White House, he affected the composition of the White House. So where are all these people who we've appointed who are all about this freedom and, and, and human rights, right? So this man had, that's right. Black people could not logistically, who could not logistically be segregated were put into literal cages, okay? Outright dismissals were common. Upon taking the white, taking office, Wilson himself fired 15 out of 17 black supervisors in the federal service and replaced them with white people. After the Treasury and Post Office began segregating, many black workers were just let go. <laughs> the head of the International Revenue Division in Georgia fired all his black employees. He's like, hey, the president's doing it. We can do it. <laughs> there are no government positions for Negroes in the South. A Negro's place, South, a Negro's a Negro's place, I think you should put is, is in the cornfield. To enable hiring, to enable hiring discrimination going forward, listen, listen to what he did now. This is the point. You guys don't understand the purpose of some of these things. You're like, well, we got LinkedIn, you know, Bill Gates, you know, who says Africa's overpopulated, bought LinkedIn. To enable hiring discrimination going forward in 1914, the federal government began requiring photographs on job applications. Right. So there goes this whole thing. Well, I'm just going to look at your qualifications. Right. In 1914, a group of black professionals led by the newspaper editor and Harvard alumnus, right, Monroe Trotter, met with Wilson to pr protest the segregation. Wilson informed Trotter segregation is not humiliating, but a benefit. Right. So now you, you now you get you get you understand. Right. Wilson formed a quote unquote, he helped with Zionism and he believed in what? 
racism. It's very clear he believes in racism. He says he's in pursuit of freedom and self-determination, but obviously Wilson is duplicitous. He takes counsel to people who he calls, quote unquote, Jews. But wait a minute, if he's a racist, how is he supporting Jews? So what color are Jews if Wilson's a racist? What color are Jews in Wilson's mind? We'll, we'll find out. Um, he says it's a benefit and ought to be so regarded by you gentlemen. He says you should be happy. Right. Separate but unequal. You should be happy. See, when you had so-called black people in segregated towns, they said separate but equal. But then all the so-called black towns like Black Wall Street and all these different places, they got burned down. There was always a pretense and a pretext to go and burn down the place. Black Wall Street was so successful, just like Wilmington, North Carolina. People were successful. They had businesses. They had all this stuff in these, these so-called black towns. People would go through because of the racist mentality and they'd get jealous. And then, of course, an incident would pop off and then that would cause a reason for a quote unquote racial riot. And next thing you know, uh, the, the people of the town are getting bombed by planes. They're like, what, the military's involved in this? I don't understand. I thought it was a disagreement between two people. All of a sudden, it used as a pretext becomes a whole a, a riot where these men rush in under the guise of you've offended one of our white race, all pretext, all pretense, and they happen to burn and murder the people of the town and destroy the so-called black town. Because they don't want any examples of, of successful, well-run towns that are quote-unquote all black. See, they want it separate, but they don't want it to be equal. And then in cases where you had examples of black people doing well on their own, They didn't like it. Right. So he says, look, it ought to be so regarded by you, gentlemen. When Trotter insisted that it is untenable in view of the established facts to maintain that segregation is simply to avoid race friction for the simple reason that if that's the case, Mr. Wilson, based on the logic, he said, well, for 50 years, white and so-called colored clerks have been working together in peace and harmony and friendliness. So, so what are you talking about? You come into the so-called White House and you appoint some people who are what? The most despised, supposedly, and the most hated. Remember, anti-Semitism was reigning supreme in America. But then the most staunch racist points to some of the highest positions. Did you, could you guys make sense of this for me? 50 years, whites and colored clerks have been working together in peace and harmony and friendliness. So, does he consider the so-called Jews to be colored? Does Wilson consider the Jews to be colored? Apparently not. Because he says whites and colored have been working together in harmony. And he says there should be a separation. But Wilson himself is working with some person whom he calls a what? A Jew. And appointing him in high-level positions. Okay? Wilson admonished him for his tone. Don't speak to me like that now, boy. In this organization, if this organization is ever to have another hearing before me, it must have another spokesman. He said, you speaking. He said, he's like, you speaking. You know who you're speaking to? Your manner offends me. Your tone with its background of passion. Right? He was passionate about Zionism, but he's not, he's not so passionate about that. Right? It is worth stressing that Wilson's policies here were racist even for the times. President Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft had been much better about appointing black statesmen to public offices, public office and political figures, including including whites. Attacked Wilson's move towards segregation. Right. It says people are like, what in the world? The, the, the influential post-civil rights journalist Oswald Garrison Villard wrote that wrote that the Wilson administration had allied itself with the forces of reaction and put itself on the side, listen, and put itself on the side of every torturer, of every oppressor, of every per perpetrator of racial justice in the South or the North. Hmm. He put himself on the side of every torturer, oppressor, perpetrator of racial injustice in the South or the North? But... Wait a minute. Let me let me just check something right quick. Who is the most pro-Jewish U.S. president? Woodrow Wilson, obviously. 
Hmm. Berger, the prize, the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer Charles of Charles Lindbergh and Hollywood producer Sam, Samuel Goldwyn, sat down with Harris to discuss Wilson's legacy and its effect on modern politics, modern politics and the Obama administration, and why he is called the most pro-Jewish president in American history. He's the father of American foreign policy. Huh. He's the father of American foreign policy. Wilson's administration had allied itself with the forces of reaction and put itself on the side of every torturer, every oppressor, and every perpetrator of racial injustice in the South or the North. He's the father of American foreign policy. Interesting. What is America's role in the world? He gave his answer to the speech of the Congress in 1917, asking the legislators to declare war in Germany was that it is America's duty to ensure the world must be safe for democracy. Didn't Bush say the same thing? Wilson was the most idealistic of America's presidents. He often spoke eloquently about America's moral obligation. He wed idealism with interventionalism. He urged his countrymen to fight preemptively for principles. What's his principles? Hmm. He further attacked it. He further attacked it for its political stupidity. The administration had put his hands, had put into the hands of the Republican Party an issue which, if they had any sense to use it, may be just a touchstone they are seeking. Really was taken seriously by the White House, which tried to court him on the issue of offering hints that it might be changing its tone. Its tone. So th he's basically saying, look. This guy, obviously, this, this guy, this civil rights journalist, Oswald Garrison Villard, was an actual journalist. And he, he was taken seriously by the White House because he had some, his voice had reach. He had some, some weight to his voice. So the White, sorry, the White House said, hey, they tried to court him. That's how, that, that means compromise and bribe him. And they're trying to tell him, hey, we're going to try to hold you up. Things are changing. Change going to come. Uh, he met with Wilson and corresponded with him on racial issues numerous times, but segregation policies, they, they, they never, never reverse. But I, I'm, I'm sorry. Wilson was unabashedly hopeful. He believed in humankind. Entering the First World War, he called Americans to fight for a peace without victory, not for empire nor for riches. So if he's not fighting for empire for riches, who's, 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 who is he fighting for? He went against his national security advisor's advice. He listened to the man he appointed, who he said, you're a Jew, you're a chosen person. That's what Wilson said. But he said, you know, He's against, he says, Negroes and colors can't work together. So what is he considered to be the chosen people? They must not be Negro. They cannot be color. Right? He talks about how the British government asked Wilson to support the Declaration of Sympathy for Zionist movement. He did. He supported the Balfour Declaration and established Palestine as a home for the Jewish people. Right. He did so despite the advice of his trusted confidant, Edward House. He said, I don't really trust you. Hmm, that's funny. So the, all this stuff about how the so-called Jews are untrusted, who did Wilson trust? Well, a person whom he considered to be, quote unquote, a chosen people who obviously can't be colored, given that he didn't believe in colors and whites working together. Right. He didn't trust America's first national security advisor. And you got to remember, at the time, the U.S. was extremely anti-Semitic. So expressing support for the Balfour Declaration was a very courageous act. Wilson was the most Christian president the U.S. had ever had. Right? Some Republicans seized upon this issue. 
Though it wasn't the political game changer for that Villar had hoped it would be, Congressman John J. Rogers of Massachusetts introduced resolutions urging investigation of treatment of Negro employees in the Treasury and Post Office Departments. Historian Nancy Weiss writes, but both measures died on the committee calendars without gaining so much as a hearing. I thought his whole thing was he was he was talking about he was looking for the advancement for humankind everywhere. All right. Didn't it say he obliged at the U.S. to assist people in the pursuits of freedom and self-determination? And this is the key word, all peoples. Okay. Wilson's racism even extended to foreign affairs. While it had been customary to attack black ambassadors to Haiti and Santo Domingo, now the Dominican Republic, Wilson didn't do that either. At the Versailles Convention in 1917, Listen, 1917. I'm sorry, at 1919. I'm sorry, 1919. Well, let's go back. In, in April 2nd, 1917, he asked the late legislature to declare war in Germany. That was, and that is, uh, it's Americans' duty to ensure the world must be safe for democracy, right? But now we're talking about what he did here at the Versailles Convention in 19, 1919, you know, two years afterwards, approximately, he helped kill a proposal from Japan calling for the treatment to recognize the principle of racial equality. Listen, he killed the proposal from Japan. While 11 out of 17 members of the meeting considered the amendment, considering the amendment favored it, Wilson, who was presiding, arbitrarily decided that the amendment had to be defeated because the vote wasn't unanimous. Wait a minute, let me, let me get this right. He's asking the legislature to declare on war, on war on Germany was that it is America's duty to ensure the world must be safe for democracy. So here, these guys took a vote on the principle of racial equality, which these guys are saying Wilson's all about. But here, when it came to a vote, two years after he helped get America into the war, and Japan's calling for this treaty to recognize the principle of racial equality, and 11 out of the 17 members of the meeting considered the amendment and favored it, Wilson, who's being lauded as this great freedom fighter, he just decided that the amendment had been defeated because the vote wasn't unanimous, and this wasn't, but, but this wasn't an actual rule that the proceedings were operating under. A simple majority vote was enough to decide that the League of Nations would be headquartered in Geneva. Wilson just really didn't want the treaty to recognize the racial equality and wanted to appease the British Empire. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Because, you know, YouTube took down my video and gave me a strike. So I just want to, I just want to get something clear here. Get something clear here. In late 1917, the British government asked President Wilson to support the Declaration of Sympathy with the Zionist movement, and he did. He ignored the advice of Edward House, the National Security Advisor, but he listened to the advice of the person whom he appointed, a person who he calls a Jew, who was a part of the, who he appointed to the Supreme Court. But America was anti-Semitic at the time. So that was a very courageous act. Now, I want to know where is 
where is his advisors and all these highly appointed people and how are they instrumental besides the the optics of locking arms with MLK? Where are they helping out? I'm not talking about the optics. I'm not talking about the photo op. Because it seems to me that the so-called so-called Christians were working together. So you had true unity here. Right? He appointed the first Jew to the Supreme Court, a fervent Zionist who counseled him about the Balfour Declaration. Well, who else wanted the Balfour Declaration to happen? The British government. Now, I wonder if YouTube going to say, what, what's YouTube going to say about this? Okay. Wilson just didn't really want to treat the treaty to recognize racial equality, he wanted to appease the British Empire. Well, what was the what was going on, guys? Remember the uh you gotta understand a lot of things that were going on at this time. You got you got the whole thing that's going on in Africa, you got everything that's going on in the Middle East, you got the stuff that happened in India, you have all these little things, Suez Canal, all this kind of stuff, all this positioning for imperialist colonialism. So people are thinking, oh, America is an independent country, an independent nation. And the reason that the so-called Israel was so-called form is because, you know, these people believe in, uh, you know, quality rights and people just hate God's so-called chosen people. That's what's going on, y'all. Don't y'all see that's why George Soros was funding Black Lives Matter. And that's why all them bricks showed up and Tifa and all this kinds of whatever you call it. And these people start vandalizing and the, 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 the news and the newspapers are right there on the spot showing the people vandalizing and tearing down statues, doing all this stuff and just chaos. Who's tearing the country down, y'all? Who's betraying the country, y'all? You see how these people are acting? Then Nick Cannon, he's supposed to be the enlightened young fella, invites all these so-called influential, so-called black scholars on the show. Then Nick Cannon says something so dumb and so stupid for a video that supposedly I think I heard was released, was recorded a year ago. And he says something so dumb and so obvious and so stupid to offend, quote unquote, whites and who else? Quote unquote, Jews. And then, of course, now that he said that, that gets sent throughout the world. And everybody just cements in their mind, yep, you know, this race thing is true. The Jew race is not the black race. And the black race is even hating on the Jewish race. They must be the most hated race in the world. They need a place of refuge. Don't we all agree? That's why the $38 billion Obama signed in to give to, to Israel. Can't y'all see it? That's why Trump voted so-called Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Don't y'all see it? They all trying to make America great again. Don't y'all see it? Don't y'all see it? Do you think there's maybe a lot of government agents forming a uh, pretending to be night white nationalists? Do you see it? That's why there was a scandal with uh, Stephen Miller who uh, endorsed this thing called Camp of the Saints. Don't y'all see it? And the Camp of the Saints was racist. And they say, well, what? He people are like confused. They're like, but Stephen Miller. Isn't he supposed to be called, doesn't he call himself a Jew? People just look at his skin. It's since you're being superficial, all of a sudden now you can't see the color of his skin? President Woodrow Wilson understood what you seem to be pretending not to understand. There's no such thing as a Jewish race.
right? He just didn't really want to treat treat the recognized racial equality, and he wanted to appease the British Empire, which was premised on subjugating, which was premised on subjugating African and South Asian peoples. Don't y'all get it? Now, I know they hated my 8 minute and 11 second video because it was just too concise. And will people make it to 50 minutes? Maybe not. But let's go on. Woodrow Wilson, just I'm just going to give you more proofs, more receipts. Woodrow Wilson was a vocal defender of the Ku Klux Klan. Wilson was, gov while, Wilson was governor of New Jersey when he became president in 1913. Wait a minute. Let me say something about him in Jersey. Here you go. Early as president of Princeton, Wilson appointed the first Jew to fact to the faculty. Right? Okay. And as governor of New Jersey, prior to becoming president, he appointed the first Jew to the state Supreme Court. Wait a minute now. While Wilson was governor of New Jersey, when he became president in 1913, but he, while Wilson was governor of New Jersey when he became president in 1913, okay, good. But he had been born in Virginia and raised in Georgia, in, in Georgia and South Carolina. He was historian William Kess Kaler notes, the first Southerner elected to the presidency since Zachary Taylor in 1848. Look, being born in a region doesn't make you racist. Don't, don't blame geography. Southern racists, yeah, okay, that's okay, accordingly rejoiced in his election because he's going to make America great. Washington, see, he's like, we're going to make the South great again. Right? you going to bring back the South, bro. They, the same stractic and tatted and tactic is getting used on these youthful idiots every day. Getting played every day. Accordingly, rejoiced at his election. Washington was flooded with revelers from the old Confederacy. Notice the same tactic is being used again and again and again. But while you're trying to get your so-called rights as so-called black people and so-called minorities, they make you look like fools when you're trying to get your rights. And that is to, that is to um, undercut and dissuade and make you look bad in front of people to say, look at, look at how they're acting. And then Nick Cannon just magically, I mean, mad, it's like, Unbelievably how he just came out and said something so stupid. And then they try to get everybody to join like, oh, we black people support Farrakhan. And what meaningful change has Farrakhan really brought? I'm not talking about the so-called businesses and all the little things they supposedly he's bringing. Hmm, it's weird how Malcolm X got killed and MLK got killed when he tried to bring the United States before the United Nations, but Farrakhan's still here. Hmm, interesting. Washington was flooded with revelers from the old Confederacy whose people had long dreamed of a return to the glory days of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe when Southern gentlemen ran the country, Kayler writes. Rebel yells and the strains of Dixie reverberated throughout the city, but that's not associated with racism. Wilson himself was a descendant of Confederate soldiers and identified deeply with the lost cause narrative. Wait a minute. He identified so deeply with the lost cause narrative that he appointed the first Jew to the Supreme Court, supposed Jew, a fervent Zionist, right? But the lost cause narrative, okay? I want you to I want you to keep this, I want you to keep this in mind, guys. Keep this in mind. I hope you made it this far. 
because it's going to get interesting, right? He identified deeply with the Nazi cause, man, according to the Confederate Confederates, which, which, according to which the Confederacy was a government of noble men trying to preserve a decent agrarian way of life against crude northern industrialist, right? Industrialist. This is all a play. This is a lie. Right? Rather than a separative movement premised on white supremacy, there was racism in the North just as much as there was racism in the South. Stop this lying. The war was not fought because it cared about black people. Stop the lying, guys. Historian Wesley Moody, which I think they corrected that, describes Wilson's most famous book, as an academic, a history of the American people, okay? Does he, does he include black people in that? No, you know how the man feels. As steeped in lost cause mythology, okay? The book was generally sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan, describing them as men, as half men outlawed, denied the suffrage without hope of justice, as, as men half outlaw denied suffrages without hope of justice in the courts who meant to take this means to make their will felt, right? He's saying the Ku Klux Klan, this is what these guys do all the time. They understand how to do things. They say, we will make ourselves the victim. We may actually have to kill some people who look like us, but in doing so, we need to identify this group as a different group of people but we can play this thing, guys, off each other. We just kill some people who look like us. And while we're victimizing other people, that will let us become the victim. And what we'll do is we'll create this thing called a Jewish race. It's supposed to be a belief. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob believed. Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. That doesn't make sense if it was a race because they'd be the same race. It said God loved Jacob, but hated Esau. Jacob believed, Esau didn't. And it says you got to be born again, not a corruptible seed. And if you sow into the flesh, you shall out of the flesh reap corruption. So they said, no, we're going to make, instead of it being everybody who has faith, because God's no respecter of person, let so whosoever come and take and drink of the water of life freely, we want to exclude certain people. Certain people. So we're going to make it a race. You get it? And we're going to build the kingdom down here and we get to choose who gets to come into the kingdom and we get to kick people out of the kingdom and we will rule supremely. But to do so, we have to we need a pretext. We need to have a reason why we're attacking people. Oh, here's what we're going to do, y'all. We's going to attack them preemptively. And but what about the American people? They're not just going to trust that you're just attacking this preemptively. Well, where there is not evidence, my friend, we will create the evidence. We will actually be the ones who instigate it. We will be the provocateurs. And if anyone catches us provocateuring, we'll just say it's the so-called Jews. And that just serves to feed into this cycle of people always blaming the Jews as being the most hated people, which also feeds into the narrative that they need a place to flee because the peoples is always hating on them. Don't you get it? We can't lose in this thing. The game is rigged, my friends. We can't lose. If they blame, if they get, if people who call themselves Jews who are not get caught, Oh, well, we'll just say that that's just more anti-Semitic propaganders because we done made them something that they're not. And then when they attack them, that'll feed into the whole cause and premise that they need a land of their own, a place to flee as God's most hated people. And by doing that, that'll give us an excuse to say that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. And that God's going to exact vengeance on those people who go against his chosen people, who's a chosen race. 
and that'll help us with the British imperialist colonist agenda to where we'll bring all nations in disarray fighting amongst themselves and then we'll come on in and talk about how we gonna bring peace. It's a lost cause narrative. Even when they're trying to fight racism, they're just reinforcing racism. Season, sorry. We gonna aim the Nick Cannons at them. We're going to have insiders who's false oppositions, who's pretending to be for them, but really is against them. And they're going to make stupid misstatements. It's just going to feed into, hey, even the black man is more racist than anybody else. And we really need to understand that we's even hated even more amongst the so-called black men. They'll never figure this out. Ain't even gonna never. They ain't gonna figure this out. Ain't a million years they ain't gonna be able to figure this out. Cause we done got their we 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 got the cemetery school, the seminary school. We got them. We done changed the Bibles behind their backs. They don't even know that. We'll really tell them you gotta avoid that KJV Bible. They won't notice that we changed the chosen generation to the chosen race. They'll never see it. They don't know it. Why am I talking like that? I hate, I'm sorry to insult any Southerners because I'm not, I'm from the South. I, I grew up in the South. I grew up in Alabama for my mom's younger years. So um, I'm just doing that for whatever. <laughs> um, the book was generally sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan, describing them as men half outlaw, denying the suffrage without hope of justice in the courts, right? Can't get no justice. How can you not get any justice in the courts? You just appointed Louis Brandeis as a, isn't this guy in the Supreme Court? And then in Jersey, you had another guy as appointed the first due to the state Supreme Court, right down here. See? How are you not going to get no justice? I'm just wondering where these great Supreme Court leaders were during these times when you was doing all this racism who meant to take this means to their will felt. This means being violent by being violence. This means being violent and intimidation, bringing violence and intimidation against black people, right? That's what this meant. He's saying basically that these people are just trying to defend themselves. So anytime you want to do something, you just cause an incident Preferably against the black so-called and the white or the blacks against the so-called Jews or even sometimes against the so-called Jews and the whites. And then that will help further the lie of a so-called chosen race. And in that way, you can get to your ultimate objective. You can bring down nations with this thing, guys. The following, because people believe it. All because they believe it. The following quote from even the following quote from the book even made its way to the what? Birth of a nation. Hmm. Does anyone see something here? Birth of a nation. Woodrow Wilson, British Declaration. He happens to be listening to the British who wanted him to help. Ottoman Empire, Palestine, birth of a nation, war, war, one, two. Anybody, anybody out there? Is anybody out there? Anybody out there? Birth of a nation. W.E. Griffith's infamous feature valorizing the Ku Klux Klan as saviors, saviors, saviors of the South. They don't want no black saviors. Right? Isn't that what COINTELPRO said? They didn't consider uh, certain people a threat. Certain people they did consider a threat. Listen, this is part of the movie, The Birth of a Nation. The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation, dot, 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 until at last there has sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, 
a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Okay? Listen to this. Lest one think this is a misrepresentation of Wilson's views, the birth of a nation huh, actually cut off the most racist part of the first half of the quote. This, look, they, this, is, this is mild. Here's what they should have said. Look, so here it is. Listen, the first part they read, the white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation. Listen, the white men in the South were roused by, by the mere instinct of self-preservation. See, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to attack us. They're trying to kill us, right? Nick Cannon uh, magically coming up saying they're beasts. I'm not buying it, Nick Cannon. I'm sorry, dude. I am not buying that. I'm not buying that. So I'm not buying that level of stupidity. I'm not buying it. The white men of the South were aroused by the mere instinct of self-preservation to rid themselves by fair means or foul, right? Of the intolerable burden of, listen, of governments sustained by the votes of ignorant Negroes and conducted in the interests of adventurers. Okay? Ignorant. This is why when those guys came to address him, he's like, I don't like your tone. Uh, I don't like the way you speaking to me, huh, boy? You know who you speaking to, boy? I'm a, I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, I support the so-called Jews, right? But you know who I am, boy? But you know who I is, boy? Don't you know who, what kind of power I have, boy? And that was only the last of three Wilson quote title cards in the film. This one came first. Adventurers swarmed out of the North as much the enemies of one race as of the other, right? He's saying, you guys are you know, enemy of one race and the other. To cozen, beguile, and use the Negroes. In the villages of the Negroes were the office holders, men who knew none of the uses of authority except its insolence. That's what Obama was supposed to represent. That's why it's Make America Great Again. Obama is being used as another puppeteer because Obama gave $38 billion. U.S. finalized deal to give Israel $38 billion in military aid. President Obama and, Minister, President Obama and Prime Minister Ben Nahu in Israel in the Oval Office. The U.S. has finalized a $38 billion military package aid for Israel over the next 10 years, the largest of its kind ever. And the two allies plan to sign the agreement on Wednesday, American and Israel officials said. He's our friend. He's our friend. And this one, the policy of congressional leaders wrought a veritable overthrow of civilization in the South. Now do you see all the, uh, See, they send these people in to vandalize, and actually a lot of people who are coming in, they're they're part of what, Antifa, right? And they're, they're, they're trying to talk about this stuff, and they got people, some stupid enough to go along with it, but these people are trying to incite because they know people just follow after people. They, they say, hey, you kind of instigate it, and hopefully the other people will join in, and they'll start being violent too. 
And then they capture that image and they send it all along the all over the world. Black lives vandalism is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, y'all. Wait a minute. That's not a black guy. That is heartbreaking. Dumb. I guess you can consider that person a black woman. These people who are doing this, they're being, they're, they're, they're tools. They're tools. See, even when you try to do something right, they can pervert what you're doing. You know, you could be doing it for one reason. Their whole thing is to create an image and create a narrative to sell, to undermine you. But when they want certain things to happen, it happens. Because you got to explain to me how this so-called racist president was able to get Americans to go into war and spill their blood in a war they didn't want to fight against their national security advisors, advice. But listen to a man who he himself appointed. So I wonder if he supports his opinions. But this person is supposed to be the most hated and despised. This guy doesn't believe in Black people even sharing office with offices with white people, hated Reconstruction, hated black people, but yet he's he's pro Zion, the most pro Zionist president ever. And then when the Japanese said, "Hey, we want to do this thing for equality, and we're going to take a vote," and then the vote pass, it passes by vote, he just changes the rules and said, "Nope, don't think so. Nah, not about that." The policy of the constitutional leaders wrought a veritable overthrow of civilization in the South, right? Civilization in the South, and their determination to put the white South under the heel of the black South. This is why there can't be any quote unquote civilization in Africa. This is why Egypt, Great Zimbabwe, Benin, Mali, all these empires, they're not, they, they don't even tell you about them. And Sudan, Nubian, Ethiopia. For his part, Wilson lent, what, the birth of a nation his approval by screening it at the White House and report, reportedly telling Griffith that it could teach history with lightning. You know why it's teaching history? Guess why it's teaching history, guys? Guess who's creating history right now? Guess who's documenting all the things that people are doing right now? Guess who's going to start blaming the Soviet history? They're going to say, well, the Jews are being persecuted right now. Guess who, uh, with Nick Cannon, with the whole point and purpose of Nick Cannon and that broadcast going all over uh, all over right now? Guess what, guess what purpose that's going to serve? Woodrow Wilson knew the purpose. Brandeis knew the purpose. Obama knew the purpose. Trump knows the purpose. The leaders of the white nationalist movement know the purpose. I think Farrakhan knows the purpose. Elsewhere in the book, Wilson attacked Reconstruction on the grounds that dominance of an ignorant and inferior race was justly dreaded. He attacked Reconstruction on the grounds that dominance of an inferior, ignorant and inferior race was justly dreaded. He was strongly against black suffrage, right? So he flipped the script. In the movie, Birth of a Nation, his whole thing was about black rule. Magically, you get Obama, supposedly in office, Obama nation, right? And then you get President, quote unquote, Trump card in office, Donald Duck Trump, Trump card, lame duck. And he decides, oh, well, guess what the capital of such and such is? And then there's this, this QAnon so-called plan, trust the plan, 
that makes you think somebody's fighting on your behalf. Hi, Nick Cannon. Hi, about, hi, uh, hi, Nation of Islam, Farrakhan. There's someone's fighting on your behalf, even on the vaccine front, possibly. But the truth is these people aren't fighting on your behalf. They're pretending to fight on your behalf for the purposes of keeping you inactive or directing your efforts, controlling your, your outcome, which is the same thing they do with so-called charity in Africa. As they pretend to be out there impacting and affecting change because they want to make sure that the change that is actually done isn't significant change and doesn't disrupt the supremacist, elitist supremacist, racist um, thing that they built and put in place. And so they find puppets that look like every color. He was strongly against, okay, it was a menace to, it was a menace to society itself that the Negroes should thus of, all, thus of a sudden be set free and left without tutelage and restraint. Without tutelage and restraint. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, guys. Teach me, fix me. Nick Cannon opens up to the rabbi. Simon Wiesenthal. See? Papal bulls. Notice the hat. Papal bulls. Papal bulls. Manifest destiny. Surround it. Nick said something so dumb. I wonder how Nick wants to make it clear he's ready to repent. Picture looking at the Hitler letter. The Hitler letter. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting how um, the Britain already had that Ottoman, you know, had that land and all that kind of stuff ready. Already ready for you. We know what God's chosen people look like because of what? The Holocaust. Who was behind the Holocaust? Was it the African nations? Nope. Southeast Asia? Nope. Who was behind it? Uh, was Hitler colorblind? Look at this guy's, look at the skin of these guys. Look at the skin, guys. Let's play stupid. Let's play stupid. Let's play stupid. Nick sitting there, Simon Wiesenthal's rabbi, Master Marvin Heyer, standing Master Abraham Cooper and Richard Trank. Remember, you set them free without tutelage and restraint. And what do they do? They vandalize. They destroy. They rob. You know what they need? How could you do that? How could you free these guys without tutelage and restraint? Teach me. Fix me. He praised those free slaves who stayed very quietly by the old master and gave no troubles. Is this going to be trouble, boy? I don't appreciate how you speaking to me now, boy. I don't like the tone of your voice, boy. It's going to be troubles. I'm going to have to get some medicine for you, boy. You're going to need to be fixed. I'm going to have to affect your RNA structure. You sick, boy. You a pestilence up on the earth, boy. You need a doctor, boy. 
He praised those free slaves who stayed very quietly by their old masters and gave no trust, but bemoaned that they were the exception, that being vagrants, he's like, know your place, boy, looking for pleasure and gratuitous fortune, right? Who are these vagrants who are looking for pleasure and gratuitous fortune? Who inevitably turn thieves in importunate beggars. Persistent. Especially to the point of annoyance. You're a pest. You're a pest. You're a welfare state. But 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 Woodrow, I actually had a job. Remember, I was working at the office when you came in and, and you fired us all. Remember that? Well, Negro, you just got no place, y'all. I was gonna fire you. But Mr. Woodrow Wilson. You just complaining about me not having a job. And I was doing the job, but we was working in harmony for 50 years. And then you comes in here and you lays us off. And then uh, Bob Johnson up there in the mail room, uh, in the what you call room, he's got a cage around him. He, he said that's in penis. His job, he can't do his job. Yeah, I, I've noticed that Bob Johnson, that Negro's performance is uh, slacking lately. I'm going to have to lay him off for a bad performance. But that's because he's caged to his desk and he got a cage around him, uh, Mr. Wilson. Stop making excuses, boy. His cousin is lazy. That boy is a lazy. I, I done, I'm going to fire him. And then I must complain about him looking for pleasures and gratuitous fortune. And that's going to inevitably turn that boy because he sought to be equals with the white man and do a job. That's going to, he's a thief. He's robbing the white man of, of, of good, good jobs. They're stealing our jobs, man. And, they, and they're trying to mates with our women. Have you seen it? It's all over, all over the internet. And they turn into just persistent Pesky little beggars, and you know what we do with pests. We need, we need, we need, uh, we need some roundup for these guys. You know, call them, get Monsanto on the phone. Call Mr. Gates. The task of ordinary labor stood untouched. The idlers grew insolent. Dangerous nights were anxious, anxiously by for fear of riot and incendiary fire. Oh, Black Lives Matter, Soros, I need you to fund, fund it. Can we get some Antifa, some, uh, can we get some uh, um, provocateurs in there? Can we get some people to kind of suggest to them that they should destroy and steal? Make sure that you have the news on the spot. At the end of Reconstruction, Negro rule under unscrupulous adventurers had been finally put in, had finally put an end to in the South, and the natural inevitable ascendancy of the whites, the responsible class, established. See what I'm saying, boy? Uh, Mr. President, um, you know all them places that we said didn't exist in Africa and South America and Southeast Asia? Well, now they find an archaeology all over the place, megalithic structures and stuff that we claim that was only done in Greeks, who Greeks whom themselves didn't consider themselves to be of the so-called white race because they didn't even know what race was. But they didn't consider themselves to be white because they found papers making distinctions between themselves and those people who we now call Europe. Um, how did we explain away all these great megalithic, megalithic, megalithic structures and advanced civilizations? And they got pictures of themselves. Well, do like my friend uh, Mr. Cecil Rhodes did. We got a person to be over the antiquities. And we will rush in as our archaeologists, who are our people. And we will make sure we get in there and get rid of any evidence 
that you know, these natives, quote unquote, did it. And to the extent that they did anything and has the images all over it, you know what we're going to do? We are going to claim that it was the white man that came and did it. And even if they look black, they really was white man, right? We're going to have the one drop rule. In America, we're going to say one drop of black blood makes you Negro. In the so-called Middle East, which we rename, one drop of rule, one drop rule means you're white. That's why the Egyptians are white on the U.S. 2020 census. Right? That's good, President. You're thinking that that's some good strategy there. That's some good strategy. Let's divide and conquer. We've been doing it forever. Wilson defended the South suppression of black voters, saying that they were being denied the right to vote, not because, not because of their skin was dark. I'm not a racist. It's not just, it's not the skin that's the problem, boy. It's because your minds, your minds are dark. You got black minds. You're acting like a blackie. You know what's happening? Your minds is dark. You need to be fixed. You need to open up to the master. Open up to the master. You need to be fixed, boy. We're gonna send some masters in to help you out. Don't, 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 don't think that it's. You know, there's no combination, there's no, there's no collusion. Do you believe in the, do you believe in the concept of a Jewish race, boy? It's really important now. It's really important that you buy into that concept. Because if you don't buy into that concept, who are we going to, when, when other so-called white people realize that it's just us betraying us for a political gain for the elites, how do we explain it? Because then we'd have to say that the white race has continually betrayed the white race. We're going to have to say that World War I, World War II, and all these other wars we're talking about in which these people are fighting and claiming they're so-called Jews, we're going to have to say, well, actually it was just us destroying us for the benefit of a few of us. I'm the one who sold you out. I'm the one who exported your jobs. I've proven that if, and even though I can be the most racist president ever, somehow I can appoint so-called, the most hated so-called race in a high prominent positions and, and listen to them and have them influence my policy decisions that send your children off to die. Wilson's racism wasn't a matter of a very unfortunate, a few unfortunate remarks here or there. It was a core part of his political, oh, racial identity. As indicated both by his anti-black policies, Nick, why are you being anti-Semitic? And by his writings before taking office. It is completely accurate to describe him as a racist and white supremacist and condemn him accordingly. He's a white supremacist? In the late 1970s, the British government asked President Woodrow Wilson to support a declaration of sympathy for the Zionist movement, and he did. He supported the Balfour Declaration to establish a Palestine in the National Home for the Jewish People. He did. He did so despite the advice of his trusted confidant, Colonel Edward House, who acted as America's first national security advisor. You must remember at that time, the U.S. was extremely anti-Semitic, right? It's just anti-Semitic, right? And, and, but he did all this on behalf of who? So expressing support for the Balfour Declaration, it was very, very courageous, guys. He's so courageous. The, the courage. The courage. Nick Cannon needs to be fixed. I'm going to leave y'all with something. Because you stayed here for this long. But ye are a chosen generation, right? Chosen generation because you've been regenerated, renewed, born again, converted, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that he should show forth the praise of him who had called you out of 
darkness. Oh, the light came to the world and the darkness. You're not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Darkness comprehended it not. Jerusalem above is free as mother of us all. My kingdom is not of this world. Into his what? Marvelous light. Jesus is the light, right? But you know what I would do? I would change chosen generation in my Bibles. Chosen generation. I was change it to chosen race. That's funny because we are the circumcision which heard God in spirit and rejoice in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh and the spirit has not flesh and bones and the children of the flesh are not children of God. That's okay, boy. It's still a chosen race. That's funny because again, Children of the flesh are not children of God. God is the spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in the spirit and truth. And the spirit have not flesh in him. That's okay, boy. We invented the Trinity, huh? Don't you see the same hats that we wear that the other guys wear? Don't you believe in the hypostatic union? Are you fooled? Don't you get the clue? Boy, don't you understand? Let me capitalize it for you. There's a chosen race, boy. Don't you get it, boy? You know what's wrong with your mind, boy? Got a black mind, boy. Got a black mind, boy. For to be carnally minded is death, though. So, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Boy, is you agnostic? Is you? Oh, wait a minute. Are you not? Are you into Gnosticism, boy? You believe in that God, the Spirit, boy? I don't like your tone, boy. I don't like the way you talking to me, boy. I don't like the way you talking to me, boy. You know what, boy? I don't like the way you talk to me. I really don't. You see, you're not a part of the brotherhood, boy. And a lot of people don't seem to understand the papal, the papal bulls, boy. If you understood, boy, them papal bulls, boy, Didn't you hear about the queen, boy? Columbus, Christopher Columbus. Tourists could be forgiven for gasping in horror at the first sight of the white hoods marching towards them on one of Spain's Easter processions. Right? For many, <laughs> let, me, let me hope. See, this outfit can be representative of something, and but you can change the representation of what it's for. You know, the cross can represent one thing to one person, but be something else to another. But, uh, you know, when you try to make God's kingdom down here on earth, like the papals did with the papal bulls, you want to conquer in the name of so-called God. But the enemy that you're supposed to be conquering is death. But you're just going around conquering and killing people Thomas, some you're conquering for God. Papal bulls. So this outfit ties in with this outfit. According to some sources, Simons possibly decided to adopt the cone-shaped hat in order to copy the outfits presented in D.W. Griffith's classics film, Birth of a Nation. See, boy, why don't you Negroes understand it? 
That's because a lot of those so-called white people don't understand it, boy. They help to keep the system going. They're their own worst enemies. Some of them will make it and we give them an image to worship and we'll tell them how we are so great. But do we really care about them, boy? Nah. We cared about them. Why do you think we sent them to fight in World War I and World War II? Nobody was attacking us, boy. But we fed into an agenda. A paper bull of sorts. You think that the colonizers have stopped? You think the pirate ships no longer exist? Oh, because we don't have the skull and bones? Son, don't you know we are part of the skull and bones? It's a secret society, boy. People like to think they are part of something special. Do we make them part of something special? Right? We make them part of something special. Do you feel special, boy? Do you feel like you're part of the brotherhood, boy? Do you feel like you're part of the brotherhood, boy? You see the sign, boy? We're going to pretend to be fighting it, guys. We're fighting against hate. We're fighting against hate. We, we're the fighting hate for good. Don't you see what we're trying to do here? See, the ADL is here to fight against hate. False opposition, guys. I'm telling you, you need to get out of this world. You need to believe the gospel. God's the spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in the spirit and truth. The spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see here that I have. There's one God. His name is Jesus. He's a spirit. One mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And when he rose from the dead, he said, the spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see here that I have. The Bible says, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So God raised Jesus from the dead. That's why it says he was quickened by the spirit. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, the things which are not seen or eternal the things which are seen are temporal. So these guys in their so-called temples and their so-called churches is beautiful and as attractive as they are to the eye. It's temporal. And it says God doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands, neither does he worship with men's hands so you can color your hand any color you want it to be god's not worship in a temple made with hands neither is he worship with men's hands or anything that you build with your hands when you do those things you're not doing them for god because god created all things right so he's telling you you must be born again because if you sow into the flesh which all men came from the flesh of Adam and Eve, since you shall of the flesh reap corruption. So you need to be born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God, the words that I speak to their spirit in their life. 
that liveth and abideth forever. So that's why Jesus told that man who said, I am a Jew. I am of the lost sheep of the household of Israel. He said, you're not my sheep. I know my sheep. You believe not, you're not my sheep. He says, my sheep, they have eternal life. All flesh perishes, guys. Temporal. God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His people have eternal life. And God himself, of course, is eternal. That's why he comes to you. He can come to you in the likeness of anyone who's died to the flesh. Anyone who's passed from death to life. Anyone who says it's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. So today, if you hear his voice, some of you will hear it, some of you won't. Harden not your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You must be born again, Nicodemus. You claim that your mom and your dad are Jewish and that uh, we be Abraham's seed. Well, Abraham believed God, the gospel priest before unto Abraham. He believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So the flesh will inherit the kingdom of darkness. And guess what, guys? This kingdom, the light came into the world and the darkness comprehended it not. My kingdom is not of this world. This kingdom is darkness. It's a cage. We need to escape the world. And the flesh came from what? The dust of the earth. And so what they'll tell you in the so-called Catholic church and all these other religions, Judaism and the false Christianity and all the other false religions that try to take on the name to sound holy, they'll say that's Gnosticism. Believing God's a spirit is Gnosticism. Believing that children of the flesh aren't the children of God, that's Gnosticism. We got to hypostatically unify those two because you're teaching that's a dangerous heresy because if you believe that, you won't be coming to this church and giving your money. If you believe that, you won't be believing in the God's chosen people who happen to be a chosen race. How could we get you to believe something else? We're going to sell you lies. So, people lie. Lie to their children. Lie to little babies. They sell themselves, sell lies. Send their kids private to private school to learn lies. Mythology. Half man, half God. No, fully man, fully God, but, you know, hypostatically unified with the flesh. A uh, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Um, forget all that. But God's a spirit, and spirit doesn't have flesh. Eh, things which are seen are temporal, but eh. Maybe Gnosticism, boy. You know what it is, boy? You got that fleshly dark mind. It's not that your carnal mind is the problem, boy. It's just that your mind is dark. You can be carnal minded and white. That's okay. It's got that carnal black mind. Dark mind. Dark. Now, boy, here's the problem with you. You're black, you're a pestilence, and you're born a corrupt seed. Because the black man is so-called, in my mind, naturally inferior to the white race. The black man has no right to the tree of life, according to my theology. And he cannot inherit the kingdom. A certain chosen race should inherit the kingdom, boy. Now, you born a corruptible seed, man. And the corruptible seed only bring forth corrupt suits, fruit. So I'm going to hang your black ass from them trees.
I'm gonna hang you from them trees, boy. I'm gonna hang you from them trees, boy. And I'm gonna make postcards out of it. I was gonna invite the children to see these postcards, boy. See the little children? And see the feats of the Negro? See that, boy? Strange fruit, boy. Strange fruit means you're a stranger to God, boy. God don't know you, Negrus. We gonna just smile that smile. See? We gonna invite our children to smile that smile. Right, boy? And we gonna say, look, this was made in the courtyard in the center of Texas. He is a 16-year-old black boy. You know, he killed Earl's grandma. She was Florence's mother. Give this to something, son, from Aunt Murder. Give this to Bud. Bud. Right? Swift justice, boy. Swift justice. It's just a few people. Don't nobody know about that nowadays. I don't know what you're talking about. You talk to the elder folks nowadays. I don't know what you're talking about. I got no, I got no idea what you're talking about. This is in 1920s. Hey guys, President Woodrow Wilson and his great Supreme Court leaders was, was Supreme Court leader prophets was in the office at that time. I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about, boy. What you talking about, man? Y'all need to stop complaining, man. What happened? You lost your job? Where was you working at the at the White House? You slaving at the job, boy? Nice and clean cut. Everybody wants to pretend it's a, uh, you know, I do an injustice when I do some kind of Southern accent because it's not that. I know it's not that. My family spoke with a Southern accent, speaks and spoke. Out of the heart, man. Out of the heart. And I'm not saying one group's more wicked than the other. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying men are wicked. Men are wicked. And the reason why the guys are in power, they're using this excuse and they're trying to say, well, if you let the blacks get in power, they're going to take revenge. Right? They're going to take revenge on us. Because you help us suppress them. Idiots. You was a useful tool, idiots. Don't you understand, boy? You poor, I want you poor white people to get this. You bought into race, and I get this. Listen in. If you keep your station and help us keep these Negroes at bay, we'll kill less of you. We'll give you a little bit better station in life. And remember, if you die, remember, you died a white man. Now, that's better than dying in one of these so down, dirty, no good, rotten. I won't say it. I won't say it. 
I won't even say it. I want to YouTube use this video as an excuse saying, well, this showed some you showed some stuff in this video, huh? The reason why we can't show this one is because of the graphic nature. Oh, but we can watch the channel choose and you can you can watch the news and see all kinds of stuff your kids don't want to see. Yeah, that's because we we got the right to, to show stuff and we want to give you a certain narrative. You don't have the right to tell your own story. You know, that's why we own all the archaeology and all that kind of stuff in history. So if you want to, you want to understand, guys. You want to understand? You start noticing the similarities in hats. I'm not a, I'm not saying just because you claim the label of Catholic or Judaism. I'm not this is not about that at all. This is not about uh so called race. Though race cism, the belief in racism. Interpret your belief in who God is. Interpret your belief. See, it's all about it all starts in your mind. And what your heart desires. See, before Woodrow Wilson got in the office, he said, hey, we've been working in harmony for 50 years. So if what you're saying is true, then what are you talking about? You're, 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 you're a contradiction. But he is a contradiction because he's, he's a racist, but he supposedly he's the Jews are the most hated people. He's a racist and he's a white supremacist, but yet he's supporting the Jews. So what color are the Jews? Right. Hitler's Pope, Pius VII. Everybody pretending. Everybody don't understand now. Everybody can't figure it out now. I just can't, I just can't figure it out now. I, I, don't, I don't understand. How do we distance ourselves as a so-called Christian America, the Christian nation? You know, we came over here. It was a Christian nation manifest destiny. We, that was so evil what the Pope did. Huh? Why did he do that to them poor people? I don't understand how the Pope can be so evil. How did America form? That's why you bring that up again. Would you Negroes get over it? Get over it. Uh, uh, okay. Now, that would be $30,000 per person to go to support uh, Zionism. And if you go against Zionism, boy, you're going against your, your anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, it means you're racist. You don't believe in the chosen race, boy? No, I, I actually don't believe in chosen races. Isn't that like a Hitler thing? Oh, boy, you think it. Boy, your mind, you got that black mind, boy. You, you talking pretty strange. You corrupt, boy. You know what happens to corrupt seed, boy? I'm going to send you a post. You don't, you, you don't want your mama to get a postcard, do you, boy? I'm going to Sandra Bland your ass, boy. We're all sinners, guys. You need to believe the gospel. You need to believe the gospel. The world is not what you think it is.
If we knew everything and all the duplicity that's going on, the Pope who fought Hitler, taking the Catholic pulse. <laughs> yeah. Guys, I don't know, I hate to trust Wikipedia for anything. The Pope asserts rights to colonize, convert, and enslave. Okay? Right? I don't want this to hit two hours, so I'm going to end it. Pope Alexander VI issued a papal bull of decree, Inter in which he authorizes Spain, 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 Portugal to colonize the Americas and its native peoples as subjects. The decree asserts that the rights of Spain and Portugal to colonize, convert, and enslave. It also justifies the enslavement of Africans. Out of our own so largest and certain knowledge and out of the fullness of our apostolic power by the authority of Almighty God conferred upon us in blessed Peter and of the victorship, vicarship of Jesus Christ, which we hold on earth, do by tenor of these presents, presents, should any of said islands have been found by your envoys and captains, give, grant, and assign to you and your heirs and successors, kings and Castile and Leon, forever, together with all their dominions, cities, camps, places, and villages, and all rights, jurisdictions, and appurtenances, and islands and mainlands, found and to be found, and discovered and to be discovered, towards the west and south, by drawing and establishing a line from the Arctic Pole, namely the north, to the Arctic Pole, namely the south, no matter where the said mainlands and islands are found, and to be found in the direction of India or towards any other quarter, he said line to be distant 100 leagues towards the west and south, and from any of the islands commonly known as the Azores or Cape Verde. With, these provi with this proviso, Proviso, proviso. However, that none of the islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered, beyond that said line towards the west and the south, be in actual possession of any Christian king or prince up to the birthday of our Lord Jesus Christ, just past from which the present year 1493 begins. And we make a point and dispute you and your said heirs and successors, lords, and them with full free power, authority, and jurisdictions of every kind. Pope Alexander the Sixth in Terra Cetera. This is before the colonization of Africa, guys. Right? So, what y'all think that Woodrow Wilson is advantage? What do you think was behind that World War II? What do y'all think was behind that World War II? All right. So I'm coming up on two hours now, so I'm going to go ahead and let it go. <laughs> not, not that anyone's going to look at a two-hour video. Hey, if you happen to get to the end of this two-hour video, put a one in the comments. If you get to the two-hour mark, put a one in the comments, okay? Praise my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen.